Cutting an essential nutrient doesn't sound very healthy, hence the word essential. But don't worry, you won't have to suffer a slow death just to achieve a supercharged metabolism. And I'm not kidding, supercharge is the correct word because as the data shows, it's really a huge increase in a short period of time. In fact, the nutrient that I'm talking about is protein. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, aren't high protein diets supposed to help with fat loss and all that jazz? Yeah. That's what past research shows. And while we're going in the exact opposite direction, I'll show you how both can be true. Both low and high protein can melt body fat, but this way you can eat even more. Okay, let's get into it. This is going to fascinate you. In this study, researchers put people on a low protein diet and compared against a higher protein diet in the same individuals over just five weeks on one diet and five weeks on the other. Pretty simple design, right? During this time, the researchers were tightly controlling body weight. They wanted body weight to remain stable. We actually see that here. Body weight is on the vertical axis and the low protein is the blue ticker there for about five weeks. And then the participants switched to a higher protein diet, the gray ticker there. As you can clearly see, body weight remained completely stable. Here's where the intriguing part comes in the supercharging that I've been promising you. If we look at the consumption, remember to maintain weight, we see the data here. It's the same general organization as the body weight data, just that the food consumption is on the vertical axis. We also see the bar graph showing the same thing in a condensed format. Notice how the low protein diet led to an increase in food consumption and the high protein diet led to a restabilization of intake. So they maintained weight but ate more. Incredible. But to put this in context, they were able to eat 20% more calories, about a 600 calorie increase in just five weeks. Now, I want you to think if you just maintained your nutrition except dropped your protein lower, that means for the same amount of food, you begin losing body fat. How crazy cool is that? Okay, but an obvious question is if they increase their activity throughout that time, their expenditure increased. The answer is no, as seen here. It's flat across the board. Obviously, you'd then assume that their metabolism increased over those weeks, especially considering what we're discussing. But the reality is there was no change in resting metabolism. So what's up with the title and what's up with their ability to eat so much more? People are eating more, moving the same amount, no change in metabolism, yet they aren't gaining weight. How? Well, it comes down to a protein your body produces called FGF21 or fibroblast growth factor 21. It's a hormone because it's secreted into the bloodstream and interacts with the tissues of your body. We'll get into certain aspects in just a bit, but for now we get some idea that FGF21 is implicated here because if we look at the short-term experiments looking at a low protein meal versus a higher protein meal, we can see the blue line indicating the low protein and the black line indicating the higher protein. Over the hours of each meal, FGF21 levels rise only in the low protein meal. Now, if we look at the same measurement time in a measure of metabolism, there is an increase in the low protein condition. So this means that when the researchers are measuring resting metabolism over the five weeks, there's a no change. But when measuring over the course of a few hours post meal, there's an increase over the higher protein condition. In addition, this change associates with increased FGF 21. But that's only half the story because we don't actually know if it's FGF21 directly that's causing this. And we also don't know how it works. Well, we don't yet, but the researchers took steps to find out. So what did they find and how they find it? This is where they turned to mice. Don't worry, we'll be returning to the human species soon enough. But in mice, they generated global FGF21 knockout mice, meaning that these mice are incapable of generating FGF21. Now, since the researchers suspect FGF21 of causing these wonderful changes, we'd expect that these mice to not experience the increased food consumption, yet the lack of weight gain. So if we pop open those data, here we're looking at wild type mice, so mice that are still able to generate FGF21. And we see the two low protein diets and the usually higher protein diet in gray. As expected, 
body weight remained stable, just like in the human data. However, the food intake was markedly greater for the low protein conditions. Again, in line with the human research. Now, if we add the FGF21 knockout mice, we see their food intake gets knocked back down as their weight remains stable. To be honest, I would have liked to have seen some metabolism measures, but at least we're seeing the feeding effect from knocking out FGF21. But it doesn't end there because the researchers related this back to humans. In fact, we're not just going to cover more of the human data, but we'll also go over what is considered low protein without causing health issues while still getting the benefits this study outlines. But before we get to that, there's also another study that covers specific components, amino acids in protein, and how not all amino acids may need to be reduced depending on the amino acid profile, as well as a mystery related to FGF21. I'm covering that along with if you could do this on a high carbohydrate or high fat diet and the exact measurement of low protein for your body in the extended edition of this video that you're watching. It's of course included with the Physionic Insiders. Link is in the description along with you know all my other analyses private podcast, live sessions with me, and much more. Again, to join, just use the link in the description. I hope to see you there. In the final experiment, before we tie this all together, the researchers did a proteomics analysis, which means that they took fat samples from all the participants, either on the low protein or higher protein diet. Then they measured the various functional proteins that the cells have created. Think you know, enzymes, structural proteins, and so on. They then compare the numbers of these proteins between the fat from the low protein group and the fat acquired from the high protein group. Here's what they saw. This is a volcano plot because it looks like it's going boom, like a volcano. Scientists and data analysts have simple minds at times. I appreciate it. That line running down the middle indicates an effect has been detected statistically. The values falling to the left of the explosion indicate reduced levels of these functional proteins within the fat cells, and the ones to the right of the boom indicate increased levels. I know this means nothing to you yet, but there's a fascinating discovery here. Many of the proteins on the right side, the ones that are more abundant on the low protein diet, are related to specific important mitochondrial proteins. Then several of the ones on the left, so reduced concentration, are another mitochondrial protein. So why this split and why mitochondria? Mitochondria, should I say it or, or are you going to say it? Okay, I'll just do this. Are organelles inside many of your cells that produce the majority of the cellular energy throughout the mass production of adenosine triphosphate or ATP for short. The proteins that are increased in the low protein diet are part of the chain of proteins called the electron transport chain. And these proteins are critical for the end result, energy generation. Now ATP generation, since mitochondria have two membranes, they pump protons into the middle space between the two membranes. That's important because those protons use the terminal protein, the ATP synthase, to pour back into the intersections of the mitochondria. And when they pour in, they rotate the ATP synthase, allowing it to generate ATP. So think of it like a water mill. The protons are the water and the wheel is the ATP synthase. And then obviously, the proteins of the electron transport chain sigh in annoyance at the ATP synthase and begin pumping those protons back to where they belong. It's a futile cycle. Anyway, that's all tied to food consumption, as you'll soon see. But remember, there was a split in the mitochondrial proteins. Most increased, but some were reduced. Those that were reduced make up the ATP synthase that we just discussed. So, why would the fat cells produce more of the electron transport chain proteins yet make less of the ATP synthase proteins? I mean, they work together. What's the deal here? Well, the protons need to keep moving from the middle to the intersection of the mitochondria. And the cell has other ways of accomplishing that, like producing what's known as an uncoupling protein, or UCP for short. The researchers hypothesized the mitochondria have more uncoupling proteins, which creates an opening for protons to pour through. But since they're pouring through those proteins, 
they aren't producing ATP. This, of course, can't stand because the cell dies with no energy. So the cell uses more substrate to energize the electron transport chain to keep pumping protons to allow some of the protons to go through the limited ATP synthase, even in spite of the increased leaking going on through the uncoupling proteins. This all relates to food because the substrate comes from the food you eat, the fats and the carbohydrates that you consume and get biochemically met metabolized to mitochondrial substrate that feeds this electron transport chain. So in short, the more you CP, the greater the inefficiency of mitochondria and the greater the inefficiency, the more substrate, i.e. food or fat molecules from your fat cells needed to be metabolized to keep cellular ATP levels constant. Unfortunately, here is where I think the study falls a bit short. While yes, this is a hypothesis, and yes, it's been shown in other studies looking at other physiological processes, they fail to prove that this is the mechanism in this study. In fact, the researchers acknowledged that the uncoupling protein was not increased in the proteomics data that we just went over a bit ago. In addition, they supplied no biochemical data to prove their hypothesis correct. So, while it's a possible mechanism and explanation, I should point out that it's just a possibility, not proven. But none of that negates the actual outcomes that we saw. People eating much more, yet not gaining weight. So how should we think about all this? Well, I'd be remiss not to mention a few things, like the fact that this is still a small study and only studied young men. I think there are inherent risks to reducing protein too low for those over the age of 60. In addition, none of the participants are engaging in strenuous activity, which has a tremendous impact on protein requirements. That said, for the majority of others, the researchers actually used a protein level that, yes, is quite low, but still above the health standards. So there's no need to completely deprive oneself of protein, an act of sure fatality. I'd also like to add that there are many recommendations to increase protein for fat loss and overall health, and those recommendations can still remain true while this study exists. It isn't either or, in fact, simply exploring a different way to achieve the same results. You could use a high protein diet and take its advantages like increased satiety and improved exercise recovery, or you could go a lower protein approach that stimulates metabolism instead. They both lead to the same end, just by different paths. Okay, so what do we take away from this? One, a low protein diet defined as 9% of total calories could be a viable option for fat loss and stimulating your metabolism. You'd calculate that by using the following calculation. Keep in mind that the caveats I mentioned earlier, it's not for everyone. Two, this low protein diet has these physiological effects through the molecule FGF21, although there are still questions about the exact mechanisms that it functions through. I think one of the uh, issues with low protein diets, though, is that there just isn't much meat on the bone, you know? Unlike this next video, which is equivalent to like a juicy ribeye, or if you're not into meat, then a juicy tempeh, uh, quinoa, black bean bowl. I don't know, something to that effect.